I want to teach today, I want to preach to you today, today from this subject, Realities of the Cross. On this Communion Sunday, Realities of the Cross. Father, bless us now as we preach the Word of God. May we preach it with power and authority in Jesus' name. Amen. Realities of the Cross. The cross. Thank God for our streaming audience. We certainly do praise the Lord for you today. By the way of introduction, by realities, I mean objectives, objective, factual, actual, and permanent truths, doctrines, lessons that exist because of what Christ did on the cross. As a result of what Jesus did, there are objective, factual, actual, permanent truths. There are lessons that we're to learn and walk in because of what he did on the cross. As a result of the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of Christ, these realities impact our relationship with Christ. With regard to our perfection and our salvation with God. Our text details the ramifications, it details the consequences of Christ's passions for and on the life of the believers. There are inalterable ramifications yes, that exist because Jesus died for us. Yes, Amen. Yes, Our text today are actually two sides of the same coin. Sort of like 2 Timothy chapter 2 and, and uh, verse 19. When you look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19, the Bible tells us um, this, that um, it is, uh, let every man who named the name of Christ depart from iniquity. It says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. God's foundation, having this seal, Paul holds up a coin. On one side of the seal it says, the Lord knoweth them that are his. On the other side of the seal it says, and let every man, let everyone that name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Two sides of the same coin. Flanked by these two realities, the believer perseveres faithfully. There are two things, and there are multiple realities. I'm going to deal with two. These things we must know, that gives, and they give us the ability to keep our relationship pure and keep outside interest, interest. Because the devil is always trying to get in your get involved in your relationship with Jesus Christ, your relationship with Christ on its purest level, on its most basic level, is uh, it's a twosome. You and Jesus. The devil want to make it a threesome. He gets in and distorts the relationship. Are you with me? Both of these realities must be fully embraced by the believer. I want to deal with the contextual setting. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the saints at Colossae, was concerned about the state of the saints. 
uh, Colossi and neighboring Laodicea in that uh, uh, Lucius Valley in Asia Minor because heretical teachings were influencing the church. The heretical teachings, they had some religious um, aspects to them and they had secular aspects. They had Judaistic aspects as well as aesthetic tendencies and ideas. The heresies, uh, they were extreme. They ranged from circumcision, food regulations, and feast days to believing that all matter, the human body, is evil. So therefore, since all matter is evil and the human body is evil, since the human body is real, it's made of matter. And if you have accept the doctrine that all matter is evil, then even after you get saved, when you get born again, what the Lord saves is your spirit, not your body. So therefore, this heretical teaching was that it doesn't matter what you do with your body uh, after you get saved because you can be as evil as you want in your body, but it will not affect your born-again spirit. Yes, so, in other words, it was, uh, it was the, the early teachings of easy believism that you can do whatever you want to do, be with whomever you want to be, be with, do anything you want to do, and still be saved. That's right. That's right. So you see why this heresy was making great inroads into the church because it was very attractive. Let me tell you something for those who are streaming and listening and those of you who are here and who will pastor and who will lead churches that have standards will never be as large numerically as churches that do not. Amen. Amen. Ch liberal churches will always draw more people than the sanctified church because the sanctified church sets a higher bar. See? That, 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 that the, market, the market is not as large when it comes to drawing people who really want to do right. Praise the Lord. That, that's, because people, people love sin. The Bible says that men, men chose darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. I don't want to stop drinking. I don't want to stop smoking. I don't want to stop hating. I don't want to give up my envy. I don't want to give up my fornication. I don't want to come out of homosexuality. I don't want to stop doing what I'm doing. So people who think like that aren't attractive to a church that says you got to stop that. They love the preacher right. who says, we don't bother those kinds of things. That's right. Praise the Lord. That's not what the, the Lord didn't call me to talk about those things. The Lord called me to just encourage your heart. Right. That explains 50,000 right. in attendance on Sunday morning right. because there are no rules. Human beings, the fallen human condition has us all in a place where we all want to be convinced that it's all right for us to do whatever it is we want to do. And we, and, and we get away with it. And, and uh, after we finish, we say to ourselves, God knows our heart. So this easy believism uh, called Gnosticism is not new. Amen. It is, it is a philosophy that has plagued the church ever since its inception. Here we are in the first century church, and it was plagued by this, this philosophical doctrine that made great inroads because, see, the Gentiles and the people, as they heard the word, before they heard the word of God, they lived in all kinds of sin. Sin was all they knew. Praise the Lord. Wickedness and, 
uh, immorality, murder, strife, debate, low living, uncleanliness, evil concupiscence, a lack of self-control, a willingness to participate in all kinds of sin. People were accustomed to dealing with demons, devils, uh, angelic beings, fallen angels, worshiping the stars, all of this stuff. All of this stuff reigned unchecked, unopposed, until Christ. Till, more accurately, until Judaism and then Christianity. The world reigned supreme. People did what they wanted. The, the order of the day was the law of the jungle. The strong survived. If you were weak, you were killed. The Spartans were known that if the child was born and the child was deformed, they'd kill the child. And they were admired for their lack of willingness to accept people whom they deemed inferior. Or if a human being was born and there was a limb missing, they thought that that, that made that human being inferior. Or if a person was born and they were blind uh, or they were sick or, or, or whatever the case may be, then they didn't count those people. They didn't count their dignity and they didn't count their worth. Dignity and worth began to be counted when Jesus came. It was Jesus who said, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Not some of you, but all ye. And I'll give all of you who come to me rest. Jesus didn't die for a certain color. Jesus didn't die for a certain economical uh, demographic of people. Jesus didn't die for a certain side of town. The Bible says God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. Jesus died for everyone. But if you love your sin, and don't 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 fool yourself. Most people love their sin. Mm -hmm. Why do you think it? Why do you think uh, before folk will give up most of their wrongdoing? Something bad have to happen to him. And then some people still won't give it up. Man laying in the hospital, he, his lungs are gone. He can't breathe. They, they, they're gone. And all he wants is another smoke. Live a shot. And if he could just get another drink, he'd be satisfied. You done lost everything cheating on your wife. Everything being a serial adulterer. Everything being out there in the world. And there you go chasing the next dress. Addicted to sin. Well, if a religion comes along that allows you to keep those uh, addictions and still grow in that religion, that makes that religion very attractive. This is why you all not fall for a Buddhism and all that stuff and um, the <laughs> reincarn uh, the, the, you know, reincarnation and you're going to die and come back and we're going in my next life I'll be this that or the other when that religion first came to America it didn't take off because the way it was taught in its truest form that you die but you come back as a cow or as a worm or as a squirrel well Americans didn't buy that I'm going to come back as a what or you might be a cow that's why in those Hindu countries Buddhism, Hindu countries, cows and stuff like that are sacred. People are starving to death. Steak out there in the yard. <laughs> Filet mignon, I mean, you name it, right out there saying moo, and they won't eat it because they think that's grandma. And when they stand before the Lord, Lord, we pray to you, and you didn't provide. God gonna show them all that cap. All oh, look, look, and you were crazy enough to believe that that was your auntie. So you know what they did with that doctrine to get it to uh, to get it to uh, to make it attractive. They changed it. They changed it. And say, oh, no, you can come back again as another person. And you can get a better shot. And you can redo some things. And so now you hear, you even hear Christians now making references. Well, you know, in my past life, I was so-and-so and so. Or in my next life, I may be. No, you keep talking like that. Your next life, you're going to hell. 
That's, that's going to be your next life. And then the Bible called that the second death. Well, this, this, this is what Paul was up against. He was up against Gnosticism. Um, uh, he was all up against those who worshipped angels as intermediaries. They believed that the angels were the, uh, the third person. You could talk to an angel. And the angel could talk to God on your behalf. Better watch it, Catholics. They, they, they had intermediaries. Well, the Bible teaches that there is one mediator, 1 Timothy 2 and 5, between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. See, as Protestants, we revere the Virgin Mary. We respect Mary. We thank God for Mary. But we don't worship Mary. We don't pray to Mary. We, really, we know that uh, 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 although she was a virgin, she was not sinless. She needed to be saved also. And she is not, although she gave birth to Jesus, she is not the mother of God. For mother of God, that phrase literally means she's recognized as deity. And she's not a part of the Godhead. She was a wonderful woman, one to be uh, imitated, emulated, and God knows we need more like her. What an awesome woman she was, and, and she was highly favored, the Bible says, and chosen to give birth to our Lord, and I'm so glad she didn't abort him. My God, today, we sure would have been messed up, wouldn't we? What an awesome lady, but, but, but you can't pray to her. The mighty Gabriel, uh, the mighty Gabriel, the mighty Michael, and all these powerful angels are powerful, but you don't pray to them. That only, I told you, it's a twosome. It's between you and Jesus. Amen. So they, they, they worshiped angels as, as being intermediaries, and, and that wasn't good. And what it did was, anytime you bring in something as a help to your salvation and, and you hold it uh, in that high esteem, that lowers Christ in your eyes and in your worship. So you got to see Jesus uh, for who he is. He's in a category by himself. Ain't nobody Jesus. Ain't nobody the Savior but Jesus Christ. Also, the thought was that one could achieve perfection by progressing through a number of uh, initiations and levels of wisdom in spiritual mysteries. That they actually believe that some of these doctrines, uh, if you become a 33rd degree, or worship for master in this organization. A 33rd degree in that organization. Unless you, you can pledge and go online to join this, that, or the other. That you move up. Bless you, man. You move up as you uh, uh, apply these disciplines. They, make you, they get you closer to God. Well, I'm here to say that if you can grow spiritually by being the 33rd, 43rd, or 53rd degree uh, in something that God have not endorsed, that if you believe that you're actually more spiritual because you're in that, if you believe you're quiet now, that you're more spiritual because, because you, you, you fell into aestheticism. Aesthetics deals with the uh, the harsh treatment of the body, self-humiliation as you do what you need to do to praise the Lord, uh, pledge, and to be accepted. So all of a sudden now, you, you, you've moved up. See, this is not new. There's always been things in place that takes the place of Christ. Yes, sir. And the and the uh, the um, the implication is for people who are not in these esoteric movements, people who are not who haven't pledged or joined this group or that group, that they don't have the spiritual knowledge that you have. But I'm going to show you where Paul said people who think that way that their minds are unspiritual. Show you what Paul called fleshly minded. 
that is unspiritual. Anytime, no matter how deep you think you are, when you, if you think you can grow in God and be made a better Christian by joining yourself to pledges, fraternities, sororities, groups, secret organizations, or anything that Christ have not directly endorsed. Not only are you not spiritual, but you are unspiritual. You're carnal and you're being misled. Now don't walk out on me. Don't turn that TV channel and don't stop streaming. You may learn something. For well, these things are not new. I often say, all you got to do is read the Bible. Praise the Lord. Paul worked hard to grow the believers beyond these false teachings. Let me show you something. He heard, first of all, he learned that they were saved. Chapter 1, verse 3 through 6 says, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye, whereof ye heard before in the word of, look at this, in the word of the truth of the gospel which is coming to you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day you heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. He says, I'm so glad that you guys got saved. We heard about you becoming believers. And then Paul teaches them that all things are fulfilled in the person of Christ. In this same chapter, verse 15, speaking of Christ, it says, Who is the image of the invisible God and the firstborn of every creature? That means that Christ, before everything in heaven, before everything in earth, before anything existed, Christ existed. Christ is before everything, so therefore he stands to inherit everything. Somebody said, well, before Jesus came on the scene, there is no before Jesus came on the scene. The Bible says all things were made by him, and without him was there not anything made that was made. So when you talk about Jesus, you're not talking about no heavy, no lightweight, you're talking about the heavyweight. The Bible says, verse 16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, Invisible, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones. Notice how Paul deals with this now. He attacks these doctrines without naming them in particular. He says all of them, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. That is, he is above, he's superior to all of these things. And by him, all things consist. Everything that, that exists is kept together by the power of Christ. And he is the head of the body, the church. See, because he's writing to the, the, uh, the church at Colossae. And he says, you need to know that the head of the church is Christ. Don't let these other false teachings and these other philosophies that, that, that bring Christ down, that diminish Christ, don't let them creep in. Because the head of the body is Christ. The head of the church is Christ. Who is the beginning, uh, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That is, he's the first one to die and to be raised from the dead, never to die again. That in all things he might have the preeminence. That in every doctrine, every teaching, in all things, Christ must be number one. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. That is, nothing of deity lacking in Christ. Everything that we need from God 
exist in Jesus. So all these other philosophies that are entering into the church, he say, you don't need them. All these other little secret groups you're joining, you don't need them. All the stuff you're pledging to do, you don't need it. Amen. Letting these folk have last rites over your body when you die. It shouldn't be. Because everything that you need from God in the church is in Christ. See, all these things creeping into the church. Oh, I'm making my argument. Verse, verse 20 says, and look at this, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him uh, to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, look at this, by him, he says, made peace through the blood of the cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, you didn't know Jesus, yet now hath he reconciled. He's brought us and him together in the body of his flesh through death. When Jesus died, he made it possible for sinful and wicked you and sinful and wicked me to be one with God. He did it when he died on the cross to present you, to present us, look at this, holy. Otherwise, you won't get holy through going through a set of initiatives, a set of initiations, and secret pledges. That's not how you move up. Christ did it. When he died on the cross to present us holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If. If. Everybody shout if. If you continue in the faith of room members, those who are streaming, saints of God everywhere, if you continue grounded, you can't begin to vacillate. Now, don't go to, the, don't go to college and act like and forget everything you've been taught. Don't get a job and forget everything you've been taught. Don't let that girlfriend or boyfriend cause you to almost act like not, not now all of a sudden you can't remember what the scripture says. The Bible says, if you continue grounded, settled, and, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Look at this. Which you have heard and which we preach to every creature which is under heaven. Whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So he warns them that all things are in Christ. And then he works hard. He works hard to grow them. Saints, I want you to grow spiritually. The things that, you know, it's amazing to me when I see Christians, when I see people who've been saved for years, to me, it is, it is the ultimate admission of stupidity. If you've been saved for years, walking with Jesus, then all of a sudden you leave the Christian church and become a five percenter. Somebody can convince you that you're a black Hebrew. All of a sudden, the comedics and all these other crazy doctrines fill your mind. All of a sudden, you begin to believe stupid things. And, and, and someone, you've been walking with Christ, and somebody can come along and hand you some documents uh, uh, printed uh, in the basement. And, and have you questioning the authority of scripture. Oh, I'm, as your set man, I am working hard to cause you to mature to where, the, where you won't be vulnerable for, uh, to those things. But, but you got to work with me. Paul said in chapter 1, verse 28, whom we preach warning every man and teaching every man. See, John, we can't do anything but preach and teach. That's it. That's it. You know, well, what is the church doing? The church ought to be doing more. Well, sometimes it ain't, it ain't the church. It's that you don't do your part. Now, after I preach and after I teach, I've done my job. 
It ain't my job to follow you. It ain't my job to go to the college campus with you. It ain't my job to follow you home. And I'm not going following you home. I'm going home. So, well, don't you think you can do something else to help these people? Beyond preaching and teaching? No. Well, what is the church doing about abortion? We're preaching against it. We're teaching you that it's wrong. We offer to help you. But we can't do no more than that. There is a responsibility to the student. You up there at school blaming all the teachers. Then lost your religion cussing the teachers out. When the truth is your child is lazy and you are. Why don't you sit down and help them learn something? Why don't you, why don't you apply yourself after school? There's a part that you got to play. I ain't gonna, I'm not going to die for you now. I'm telling you, Jesus died. Didn't you hear me sing that? Jesus died. And he rose again. Ain't no, ain't no point of me dying. I'm going to take a few days off next week. Don't call me. Oh, but pastor, I'm preaching. And I'm I preach. I preach and I taught in the convocation. I preach in the convocation. And I'm preaching this morning. Now, if with all of that, and yesterday, I was at the hospital from, from between uh, Wake Med and, and the UNC from uh, 10 till about 5 p.m. in the afternoon. After all that, now, now, look. Am I right? Am I right? Got to catch on. You young folk, Sister Reetha gave y'all a big blessing. A lesson and a blessing. Now, really, really, she gave you enough that 40 years from now, you ought to stand up and testify. Say, that was when I got my stop. I got a lesson and a blessing. Now, you can't come back to her 40 years later saying, is there something else you can do to help me? Tell her, no. And go on and find somebody that you can help. Say amen. Some of us want 50,000 chances. Life don't offer 50,000 chances. You don't get that many do-overs. Do you hear me? You don't get that many do-overs. I don't raise, I don't, I don't raise my children twice. I raised them one time. Praise the Lord. Paul said, said, where, where, whom will he preach and warn every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that, that, that we may present every man. Look at this. Mature. King James says perfect. Mature in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor. Striving according to his workings. Which worketh in me mightily. For I would that you knew. What great conflict. I wish you knew. The boxing match. The fight, the wrestling match, the contention I have for you. I wish you knew about the demon spirits that I have to fight, that all that I got to go through to get the word of God to you and to teach the word of God to you. He said, I would that you knew the conflict that I have for you and for them at Laodicea and for, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. So they never met him. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love. And until all riches, you don't mind we read the Bible, do you? All riches of the full assurance of understanding. I want you to, I want you to know this thing. Look at this. Not through just, I got a feeling everything will be all right. But through the full of assurance of understanding. To the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and the Father and of Christ in whom, look at this, in whom are hid, in Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. What, what you doing dabbling in this and dabbling in that when in Christ all the treasures of knowledge that you need you can find in him. And this I say, uh-huh, lest any man should beguile you, lest any false teacher, lest any iman, any rev, any 
five percent of any frat brother, lest any mason, lest anybody come and beguile you with enticing words, lest any slickster come and talk you out of your faith. They talk you into fornication, adultery, immorality, ungodliness, lest anybody come and beguile you. For though I be absent in the flesh, I am with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order. Order. And, steadfast, and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Now sometimes we get tired of order, but you need order. Human beings learn through order. We learn through repetition. Sometimes you may get, order may be a little boring. Some, everybody who's been married for a long time understand that the thing that is necessary for a long marriage uh, also creates a certain degree of monotony. Same old, same. Come home. Honey, I'm home. Okay. You'll watch a certain show, go on a certain meal, you become predictable. And when you first get married, it is the newness, the excitement. We're going to try it on the washing machine. In the garage. Breaking every bedroom. Oh, yeah. Sideways. Whatever. Become a contortionist. But if as time go on, you try to keep that and you mistake that as the strength for your marriage, you're going to soon leave your spouse. Because over time, there has to develop a consistency, a sameness, a order. Praise the Lord. Order. Order. Every service, it seemed like to me at a certain time, first lady have words, and this one does that, and that one does. Order. That has been the key to the consistency. We can't make it change in every three months. Oh, I heard, oh, did you hear over here at this church they're doing well let's bring that up. Let's let's do that now. Then you hear about something else they're doing. Okay, well let's try that now. Then you hear about something, okay, let's try that. No, no, no. Try that in your marriage and see what will happen. Some of us, our children are messed up because they've had too many daddies. You had them children, and you broke, you didn't make it with that daddy, and then you brought in another daddy. You broke up with that guy, then you brought in another one. You broke up with that guy, and you brought in another one. So now you've raised a child to believe. You've damaged them because they've, they, they've gotten attached. They've grown, their hearts have grown attached to too many people, only to have their hearts broken over and over and over and over. Major heartbreak ten times by the time they're ten years old. And you don't know that you have damaged that person severely because in their minds they are convinced that relationships don't last long. You taught them that. I'm preaching better than you are responding. Somebody shout, order! Paul says, wow! We, praise the Lord, behold your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Lord, every believer has to develop a pattern. They ought to know, don't call at a certain time because they're praying. Oh, it's Thursday night, 7.30. Oh, they're at church. Oh, it's Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. And there's no need to call in your house. That's the, that's the main time at the wooden household the phone don't ring. Not unless it's some telemarketer. He hadn't figured it out yet. 
Oh, they got a, they, they got me on a computer, uh, you know, a robocall. Nobody, ain't no point in calling. I'm always moved when people say, you know, I've been, I've been trying to find you. I've been trying to get up with you. I'm the easiest man in Raleigh to find. Because you know where to find me on Sunday. You know where to find me at certain times. There has to be a steadfastness, a consistency. The believer needs to set up a, a, a consistency. We learn through route. Teachers teach the same thing over and over and over. They repeat it over and over and over. You can't move on to the next lesson until the child knows this lesson. This is why it's so important that all the children come ready to learn and, and give them a good hot meal and parents get them ready to learn because you don't want three children slowing up the class for everybody else. That's a problem now for the rest of the kids who are ready to learn. Y'all, you didn't bring yours ready to learn. So now you argue that you slow down the, the 18 or however many are in class for the three. The, the, the church, as a church, you got to learn. At a, at a certain time, we have a right to expect you to have grown to certain places spiritually. Oh, I'm taking too long. I'm taking too long today. I'm taking too long on this, so let me go on and move on. As they behold your steadfastness in Christ, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Told them, don't you let nobody come in and teach you with that crazy stuff. You walk in Jesus Christ. Don't be looking over there wondering, I wonder what it would be like to pledge. I wonder what it would be like to be in this group or in that group. No, I'm in, I'm in a group. I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm in a group. I'm in one. I mean, when I was in college, they talked to me about pledging. I said, I'm in one. Well, what, what's the name of yours? The Church of God in Christ. Jesus. Sanctified church. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. And you know what I didn't have to do to get washed? I didn't have to humiliate myself. I didn't have to go into asceticism. I didn't have to practice self-humiliation. I didn't have to run all over campus. I didn't have to drink so much liquor till I die. Get drunk. Boy in college the other day, drank himself to death. The parents mad with the fraternity. They mad with everybody but the child. But that boy was older. He, he knew not to do it. Go let somebody pour a whole gallon of liquor down your throat to see if you can hold the liquor. You want what? You want to be a part of it that bad? What? You, you want me to do what? You ask who to do what? I remember someone asked me to do something. I said, you want me to do what? You want me to do what? I said, I'm holding this. I was 17, 18. I said, I'm holding this preacher. I can't do that. Well, this is tradition. I said, I don't care what it is. I ain't doing that. Because I'm going to church Sunday, see? And I can't go to church on Sunday having done that. And in those days, there was no internet, there was no Facebook, it wouldn't have been online, but I would have known. And my Savior would have known. See, this kind of preaching makes your mind strong and embarrasses you for being weak. That's all right, you'll get another chance. Next time, stand your ground. Paul says, verse 7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught abound therein with thanksgiving grow in this thing and be thankful that you're in it grow and be thankful grow and be thankful can I get a witness am I preaching pretty good here and then he warns them against the influences of the world Oh, he warns them. Chapter 2, verse 8, he says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. He's speaking of these ideologies, ideas, and teachings. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments, the rudimentary elements of the world, made up doctrine, made up worldly doctrine from men, elements or forces of the world. As I give you an example, uh, the, uh, uh, the zodiacs, the, the astral deities, saints aren't Sagittarius. The saint is not a cancer. You better watch that stuff. You may get one. The saints, praise the Lord, are not on the Taurus. What? What is your sign? 
on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross bum hitting everything some of y'all reading your reading the the horoscope well horoscope said today ain't gonna have a good day how about reading the bible how about reading the bible god did put the stars up there for us to read oh yeah he did he did uh, uh, the sign of jesus birth was a star the captains navigated people built uh, maps and navigated the waters by the stars black folk got free following the north star god did give us stars but the stars were not to be worshipped they are to be read the stars are not to control us the only star that we should be controlled by is the bright and morning star and that's who jesus is but he says now i want to warn you don't you be spoiled through these uh, uh traditions of men and and the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. You be spoiled after Christ. For in him, here we go again, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And we are, look at this, whoo, complete in him. Now, isn't it, now wouldn't, don't you think the church would be different if we just believed that? Oh no, we don't think we're complete unless we got a wife. Unless we got a husband, unless we have this, unless you have a degree, unless you have that, you, you, I'm just, it's just something missing. I'm, just, I'm so incomplete. You know what's missing? It's your relationship with Jesus. You need to build up on that. I'm not saying that these other things aren't important, but nothing satisfies the soul of a man like Jesus Christ. If you don't believe me, ask the people who are married. Ask them if they need something else. <laughs> Ask the rich. Ask the famous. Ask all of those who seem to have everything that you think you need. They'll tell you that once you get those things, they still don't satisfy. A famous writer was asked, what do you wish? Do you know today that you wish you would have known as you were climbing life's ladder of success. His answer was candid and soul shaking. He said, I wish that someone would have told me that when you get to the top, that there's nothing there. No matter what you accomplish in this world, only what you do for Christ will last. Only what we do for Christ will satisfy. Can I get a witness in here? Oh, I'm going to preach in just a minute. I'm going to preach in just a minute. And he says that you are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities. Christ is above all powers. Head of all principalities and powers in whom also are circumcised. Look at this. In whom also ye are circumcised. Talking to the Gentiles. Telling them don't let these, these Jews who are trying to get you. Get you because in Christ you are circumcised. Made without hands. In the putting off of the body of the sins of the flesh. Circumcision takes place, the foreskin is removed. Paul said, Jesus circumcised you by taking that sin out your life. And then verse 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein you also are risen in him through the faith of the operation of God, or who hath raised him. God raised Jesus from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Good God Almighty. Hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. A big thank you goes there. When Jesus died and rose again, he made it possible for us to be forgiven. And you know what? God had a certificate of debt. Against all of us. The Bible says, look at this, and blotting out the handwriting of ordinances. That is, the certificate of debt. 
That was against us. You know why it was against us? It's because we were guilty, which was contrary to us. It opposed us because we are guilty. And this is an allusion to the law because men were not able to live up to the righteousness of God. And Jesus, even though we were guilty as charged, the Bible says, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Jesus died for the guilty. And the debt I owe, he paid for me. Can I get a witness? And look at this, it says, and having spoiled principalities and powers, these demonic powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. That is, when Jesus died on the cross. God Almighty, he defeated all demonic powers. Let no man therefore uh, judge you. Don't you let these people make you feel like you're less by meat or drink or in any aspect of a holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath. Telling them Gentiles, don't let these Jewish Gnostics make you think that you are somewhat less because you are not adhering to a set of religious ordinances that they put in, praise the Lord, that do not pertain to you, which were put in place until Christ came. Verse 17 says, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body, the true, the truth is of Christ. Then it says, now going to, praise the Lord, these mystics, and these deep folk with these other doctrines that, that are contrary to our teachings. He says, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility. That is, this is aesthetic teachings. Self-humiliation. Harsh treatment on the body. Mocking humiliation. You putting yourself through all kinds of degrading activities so as to join their group. He says, don't let anybody do that to you. And the worshiping of angels. You're not supposed to worship angelic spirits. And look at this. Intruding into those things which he hath not seen. Vainly puffed up in his fleshly mind. That is, he's claiming to have access by visions into things that he hadn't seen. And, he, and he's arrogant with his, he thinks he's spiritual. But the Bible says it's a fleshly mind. I'm here to tell you, all of you who are trying to convince us that we are five percenters, you woke folk, and all these other things, and you're trying to convince us that we're backwards because we love Jesus. You're trying to convince us that you know something that we don't know. I'm here to tell you, you have the unspiritual mind. The spiritual mind is the man who believes the Bible. Grab hold to the Christian doctrine and lives it with everything that he's got in it. Somebody ought to shout something right there. Oh, I know sometimes you don't know what to do because you hear the defense, the other side of the argument so seldom. But here we are with the other side. I, got a, I was awakened in 1977 when I saw the light. Black Lives Matter is a true statement. Black Lives Matter as a, as a religion, as a movement, is a godless movement. It doesn't acknowledge Jesus Christ. It doesn't acknowledge the church. It doesn't agree with God on the definition of marriage. It is a wicked movement. And don't you think, don't you let these people fool you and pull you into this stuff and then try to make, convince you that you're not an authentic black person just because you're not out there falling for that garbage. My God, I'm in Christ and I'm fully satisfied. I feel like preaching. We're going ready to go home now. But I heard him. He said, now, they, are, they have unspiritual minds. And look at this. Here's what they're doing. And not holding. Not holding. Somebody, who that said not holding? Who said that? Wave your hand. See, she's dead on it. See, she, she heard my point. She, she got it before I got to it. And not holding. Not holding the head from which all the body Ah, uh, by joints and, and bands ha having nourishment ministered 
uh, and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. The head is Christ. And when you begin to believe all these other things, when you get watered down with yoke, woke, when you get watered down with black lives, when you get watered down with this fraternity, when you get watered down with this sorority, when you get watered down with the Masons, watered down with the Eastern Stars, watered down with this doctrine, watered down with that, then you're not holding Christ in his proper place. Because if Christ is, the, the, here's the truth, if Christ is all of that, then what you need all this other stuff for? If Jesus, if Jesus is truly all in all, then what, what, what are you joining all these other things? Uh, Paul says if Jesus is all in all, then church at Colossae, kick, kick these other things out. Hold Christ in high esteem. Do have anybody who holds Jesus in high esteem? Mm -hmm. Let me deal with the first reality, and I'm almost done. Oh, Lord. Says here in verse 20, Wherefore, uh, if you be dead with Christ, since you are saved, uh -huh, since you are born again, since you're dead with Christ, notice this, from I get about 50 to shout from. from. Can I get a few hundred to shout from? from? See, when you get saved, the Lord saves you from things. Oh, Lord. He calls us out of things. He says, since you therefore have been dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, from these worldly teachings, from these doctrines that are rooted in human wisdom from these doctrines that compete with the lordship of Jesus Christ from these doctrines that, that, that help you do good community service and you do the community service in the name of that group but you don't give Jesus the praise for it from these organizations that are in churches that compete with hallelujah ah, the doctrine of Christ since you've been saved from the rudiments of the world, Paul asked them, why as though living in the world are you still subject to the audience? He says, since you've been saved, why is Gnosticism still going on in the church? Since you've been born again, why, praise the Lord, how did the Masons get in? How did all the fraternities and sororities and all these things that we're, y'all ain't giving no amen. How did all these things get in since you've been saved from those things? And uh, he says, why is it that you're behaving as though, praise the Lord, you're still subject to those things? And the things that, they, that those false doctrines tell you to touch not. The things that the false doctrines tell you to taste not and the things that they tell you to handle not, you're obeying them. When I haven't saved you from that stuff, why are you still going by, praise the Lord, the rules of the frat? Oh, Lord, you've been out of college 40 years, but you're still there. You were lost when I saved you. You were lost when I brought you out. Why are you still flashing them signs like you're still in that mess? Oh, Lord, why is it that you're in a secret organization and you got a certain stand that you give and a certain handshake and it's still in the church? If I've saved you from it, then why are you still obeying those rules? Why are you still going by those ordinances? What they tell you not to touch, you won't touch. What they tell you not to taste, you won't taste. What they tell you not to handle, you won't handle. But let me tell you what your future is. It says, which all are to perish with the using. If you hold on to that mess, you're gonna be destroyed. I want you all to know who are, who are streaming and who will hear this message on delayed basis that we have good attendance today but the saints hallelujah ah, they're a little stingy with the amens and I know when you're listening you're learning 
but I enjoy just put, poking a little fun at you. Isn't it amazing that we're submitting ourselves to doctrines that have no eternal power? Isn't it amazing that some churches, as a draw, they use organizations that have no place in the church as a drawing card for that church? And those things compete with the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And you may say that they don't, but they do. If they're doing it in your church, they're competing with Jesus. If you're giving it a ritual, you're competing with Jesus. If you swear an oath to those things, it competes with Jesus. If you pledge your allegiance, it competes with Jesus. Good God Almighty, if you got a secret handshake, if you got a secret ritual, if you got a secret vow, it competes with Jesus, for Jesus sees the light of the world. And when Jesus saves us, he calls us out of all that stuff because he says, I want to be the one. I want to be the one to satisfy you. I want to be the one to open doors for you. I want to be the one to give you connections. I want to be the one to help you move up the ladder. Good God Almighty, I'm enough. Could I get about 10 people to shout and declare that Jesus is all I need? Yeah! Oh, I can hear him. I can see him getting mad with me. But you get mad. You you get mad. Call me a name. But, but, but show me why I'm wrong. He said, why are you submitting yourself to these doctrines of men? He says, after the commandments and doctrines of men. He said, now I must admit that these things do. They do indeed. Paul said, I'm going, to get, I'm, I'm going to get credit now to the false doctrine. He said, they do indeed. Uh, they, which things have indeed a show of wisdom. Oh, yeah. You can name some good things that they do. Oh, Lord. You can have a fish fry and give the money to the homeless. You can put on a drive and help folk in the community. Oh, Lord, good God Almighty, you can invite the doctors out and let the medical people uh, take everybody's blood pressure and swab their mouths and do a good public service. Uh, Paul said, yes, I'm not saying that they don't have good things. Uh, it's a good thing for folk to put on a march to march to raise money to cure cancer they're gonna have a walk to cure this disease a walk to cure that disease the problem with these walks if they walk at 11 o'clock on sunday morning you ought to, you ought to walk on monday you ought to walk on to you got six other days that you can walk. Why not walk after service? Why not walk in the evening? But no, you got to compete with Jesus. And that's why they're not as successful as they could be. What am I saying? Nothing and nobody should rival Jesus Christ in your life. Do you love Jesus? Let me hear you say yeah. Yeah! Yeah, Lord! Thank you, Jesus. He said they do show indeed wisdom in wheel worship and humility and the neglecting of the body. He said, yes, it's true to join these groups calls for a degree of discipline, wheel worship, mocking humility, neglecting the body. He said, but the truth is not to any honor of the satisfying of the flesh. He says, after you go through all of that 
and you get in all those groups, they do not curb your, your, your appetite of self-indulgence. You're still the same, the same you. He said, but if then you've been risen with Christ. So the first reality is that, the, that Jesus, the death of Christ on the cross, demolishes once and for all all the wisdom of the world that is contrary to Jesus Christ. The truth is these other things have no value because they're contrary to Jesus Christ. None of these things are of any value in growing you spiritually. You need to participate. In fact, it is a detrimental if, if you participate in these things it hurts your spiritual growth the truth is you got to do like Paul did he was a Pharisee of Pharisees a Hebrew of Hebrews touching the law he was blameless but when he got saved he gave it all up he came out in pursuit of the more excellent knowledge of Jesus Christ and he says here since let me give you the second reality since you then have been risen with Christ he says seek those things which are above when you get saved hallelujah the resurrection confirms that there is a future glory for the believer that we look forward to getting our reward on the other side and once you get saved that there comes a shift in your thinking that comes a shift in your mind he says if you then be risen with Christ seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God and set your affection set your mind set your thoughts set your will on things above and not on things of the earth for you are dead and your and your life is hid with Christ in God I want you to know that you belong to Jesus and when Jesus and when Christ who is our life shall appear good God Almighty we're gonna appear with him in his glory and since there is a coming glory he says mortify mortify i know they've been trying to tell you that all matter is evil i know they've been trying to tell you that you can do anything you want with your body and god won't it won't matter but paul says no just because there is something waiting for us on the other side he said mortify the members that are upon the earth that is you got to put to death those are those things that are in the flesh he comes at fornication premarital sex extramarital sex he said let it go i can't get no help he says give up premarital sex uncleanness inordinate affection it ain't even right for a man to love a man like a man supposed to love a woman it ain't right for a woman to love a woman like a woman supposed to love a man i know that obama said it doesn't matter who we love but he told a lie from the pit of hell it does matter you ain't supposed to have the affection for a man that a man should have for a woman you're not supposed to have the affection for a puppy like people have for a little baby you're not supposed to see a little pet as your child the devil is a liar we got to let God clean up our affections we got to let God clean up our desires yeah yeah Somebody lift your hands and say, Lord, clean me up. Woo! Evil 
concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. Things you covet, you make a God out of those things. That's idolatry. He says, for which things sake the raft of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. The reality is that when you get in Christ, because there's something greater, we shed these other things. We shed these other things. The reality is, he says, despite what they're trying to tell you, when you get in Christ, you do indeed mortify the deeds of the body. You do indeed attack the cravings. You may not be able, you may not be able to help. You may not be able to, praise the Lord, prevent a certain craving. But thank God that when that craving shows its, rears its ugly head through the blood of Jesus, you're able to kill that craving. You're able to attack that craving. You attack it with prayer. You attack it with scripture. You attack it with systematically aligning yourself with the word of God. With the word of God. There are all kinds of the, the human body, the, our fallen nature. It's amazing the things that we can think. It's amazing how low the human mind can go. Oh, it's amazing what it can crave. But the Bible says that we can kill those things. As a matter of fact, we're commanded. If you are risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ said it at the right hand of God and set your affection, affection, your mind. See, your, your, the affections is not your emotions here. It's your mind, your will. Affection, my brother, deal with intentional shifting. I'm not going to do this. I am not going to think this. I am going to think that. Now, as this wars with my mind, the, 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 the this is not going to win because I'm going to think about that because that's where Jesus is. And I want him to change me from the in, inside out. I want him to align my thinking, align my thoughts. People are holding that cat. Well, this is my little baby right here. A cat is not a human being. Well, my little puppy dog, you can love the dog all you want to, but that dog ain't no person. The dog is not a person. See, in order to affections, it ain't just perversion. There are people, married couples, who, who, who don't want children and go their whole lives, but we don't want kids. You know what they wanted? Things. I want things. I want uh, the games, Xbox, toys, cars, all the things. And oh, you got a beautiful house. And you know, she can't, I can't have a baby. It may mess up my figure. So you got all those things. And over time, over time, over time. You learn, you learn that that thinking was flawed. For the Bible says that children are a heritage from the law. That's what the Bible says. The Bible didn't say that children cost money. The Bible says that children are a heritage from the law. Now! Your steps done got slow. Your eyes are dim. Your mind ain't as sharp as it used to be. You don't play Xbox no more. That car, long gone. And the ones you now have, you can't hardly drive. And you're surrounded only by people that you got to pay. That's right. And you can't go back and get that time. Inordinate affection will mess you up. 
It will have you placing your mind, your soul. You, oh, oh, you just, you, you, you were so busy. You couldn't see. You couldn't see how neglected your husband was. You, you couldn't see how neglected the wife uh, was. You, you couldn't see how neglected the children were because you, you were focusing in an inordinate way, inordinate too much. We praise the athletes. Yeah, so and so. He got eight Super Bowls, but look at, you know, he was so dedicated to the game that he lost his, he had three marriages to fail and, and, uh, and some of his kids got in trouble and his daughter committed suicide and all that. But you know what? He never missed a practice and oh, he always showed up on time. And we praise him for that. We praise him for that. That's inordinate. He would have been better off to never get a Super Bowl and raise his children. Never win. And, and put, give that boy, little boy, he's standing there, a champ, little boy standing there thinking he's a girl. And, and we, we, we invite him uh, to, 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 to teach us life. And he, and, he, and he won't own up. He won't say, you know what? You know what? Instead of saying, I support my son, boy standing there looking like a girl. Instead of, instead of saying, I support him, he should say, you know what? Let me tell you all something. This is my error. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. When I, I, I didn't see it when I should have saw it. And then when I did see it, I was so busy. And I wanted to be so politically correct that I went along with it. And then other people then who are not as successful according to the world's definition, they begin to go along with this stuff. And we concentrate on things to the expense of our family. Some of you the devil have called you to see your children as a liability. You see your family, you actually view your family as uh, obstacles that hold you back. That's in order. If I didn't have, if I didn't have these children, I could do thus and so. That's in order. It wasn't for the church. That's why I don't like upper room. You can't do nothing. What's inordinate is what you want to do. Uh, that, that you want to do it that bad. Well, I left because, because he said something I didn't like. Okay, I probably did. Now, whether or not, I give you that. But whether or not what I said was accurate, is not, that's, a different, that's a different conversation. But, all right, but, but what about, you mean, tell me, you mean to tell me that that one phrase in this sermon that made you leave, that outweighed all the people that we're feeding? Let's, think, let's talk about the other things the church does. That outweighs all the folk that we visit in the rest homes, in the shelters, all the babies that we've saved, all the prisoners who have gotten saved in the prison ministry, all that outweighed, that, 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 that one thing outweighed all that, that's an ordinance on your part because nobody agrees with anyone all the time. And if that's your criterion, you're gonna join every church in Raleigh. You, you ain't gonna never have one. If you get one, you're going to get people who are going to apply that same standard to you. And the moment they disagree with you, it, it ain't going to take but three Sundays. Then they'll be gone. And you'll never grow based on your own affection. I couldn't stay married to him. I couldn't stay married to him. In order that. Pastor, I just couldn't get past. You name one thing. Or you bring up. Nine other things. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, well, yeah, I like all that. But there's one thing, one, I'm not talking about sin, I'm not talking about cheating, but one thing, and that, that one thing, that one thing outweighs everything else. There's something wrong with that thinking because no human being is perfect. I talked to men one day. In our uh, men's meetings on Tuesdays, 
and the brothers really show up. The main ones who need to hear it don't. I said, now when you praise the Lord, think about things about your spouse that you find that may be unattractive to you. Let me tell you what helps you. Don't lean in. What, Pastor? She finds things about you that's unattractive to her. <laughs> now sit back. Everybody's got something. Hey, 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 everybody, everybody. Ain't nobody all that. Everybody, everybody come with something. Something to overlook. Something that to put up with. What? You thought she married perfection? Ask her. <laughs> Call me. Ask her. Say, so you just be truthful and, and, and don't pull any punches. I promise there'll be no reprisals. She'll write a book. <laughs> and then say, but I love you anyway. Everybody. See, this, 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 this is killing us. Got black folk. Oh, black folk hate America. I'm just, I, I don't even want to get into it. I, I, people of color, people of African descent live better here than anywhere in the world. Well, I'm, I'm going to the motherland. Go. I'll stand right here. You'll be back. You'll be back. Because more, more of them migrate here and stay here than those of us here go there. And those who go there thinking that that was what they wanted. Six months later, you run into them at Walmart. So I thought you, I thought you moved. Oh, no, 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 we back now. Well, what happened? I don't feel like going into it. I know what happened. See what happened? What happened was what we told you was going to happen if you leave. Well, I don't love this country because they own slaves. Well, what about the fact that we ended it? Any credit for that? Any credit? Well, this country has done a lot of bad things. Well, that's true. Well, let's name... All the good things that it has done. All of the opportunities that it has afforded us. We, we run and hold public office. We're owners or part owners of, uh, of professional franchises. Own record companies. Own businesses. Oh my Lord. Have our own university system. And now have access to all the rest of them. Oh we can go down the list. Drive in any neighborhood, no matter how big the houses are, you'll find us. All kinds of things. Just go eat anywhere you want to. Right now, the nicest restaurants in Raleigh are packed out. It's Sunday. Packed out with us. The truck, the truck got to come in Monday and, and restock. <laughs> All, all of these blessings, and you stand up there mad. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna say the prayer of your allegiance. I ain't gonna, I'm not gonna honor. I'm not gonna honor the country. I'm not gonna honor the country. I'm mad with the police. And as soon as the police, you pull them out, the thug who break it in your house looks ju looks just like you. Yeah, you, you stand. But but you're breaking in. But you're black. They say, shut up. <laughs> and give me your things don't let the devil mess up your thinking I've preached long enough the second reality is the cross changes us we shift because of it we shift our will we shift our thoughts 
the cross promises us. There's a glory coming that's unlike anything the world will ever offer. When Jesus comes, oh, trust me on this. When Jesus comes, the things that he has for us, the blessings that are in store for us are unlike anything that we will ever be able to imagine. It is true that one day in God's kingdom, we'll pay for it all. And because we look to that, then in the meantime, what we do is we work on ourselves. We don't work on ourselves to get saved. We work on ourselves because we are. Because we are. And we want to continue in this. We want to walk worthy of the vocation wherein we are called. We want to represent the Savior who has done so much for us. Because we are saved, the reality of it is you don't have to submit to the doctrines of this world. You don't have to join this group and that group and pledge over here and pledge over there and become a part of this and become a part of that because you want to do that so you can be connected and get ahead. No, 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 no. Come out and be free. And let the Lord elevate you. And then what you can't get because you're free, do without. That's good. That's good. Amen. Do without. Say, because I have something that matters to me more than that. I have Jesus. I have Jesus. I have Jesus. And I have joy. I have joy. My joy in Jesus is not based on what Jesus will do for me tomorrow. My joy in Jesus is based on what Jesus did for me on the cross. Most of us do not have joy in Jesus because it's not based on what Jesus did on the cross. It's based on what you want Jesus to do when I open the altar. Now, if he does whatever it is you have up before him, then you have joy. If he doesn't, you're perplexed and you don't understand and you're waiting on him and you won't hardly praise him right. But when you see this thing the way it should be seen, the most awful and the most beautiful thing all at the same time is the cross. It is the, most, it is the ugliest and the most beautiful thing that God would die for you and me, that Jesus would take our place. Today we pause. Today we come. Hallelujah. We accept both realities. One of the reality number one, we're free from those things. Don't entangle yourself. Amen. You're free. College students, you're free. Walk in the power of being an individual. Well, I, I just need to belong to someone. You belong. Amen. You belong. Amen. You belong more than we could belong back in the day. When you can't get home, you got, it's on your phone. You can stream it. There wasn't no streaming in, in, in 70, 77 and 78, 79, 80. Amen. The connections wasn't like, like it is now. Praise the Lord. God has given you all kinds of opportunities. Praise the Lord. The Lord has set you free. Stay free. I'm praying that my brothers and sisters of a darker hue don't be vulnerable to these little side religions. These little side heresies that come up that are designed to rob you of your joy. Keep you mad at your country. Keep you hating folk who don't look like you. Got you thinking, you got to really think a whole lot of yourself to think that white people get up every day trying to figure out how to keep you down. Because the question becomes, who are you? Most people get up every day trying to figure out how they can get ahead. If you really want to know the truth. Don't let the devil clod your mind with stuff like that. You got to let the Lord set you free. And stay free. Stay free. I got Jesus. But pastor, to be honest with you, I need something else. I have Jesus already. But I feel like I need someone else. I need something else. What is wrong with me? You won't like my answer. 
you won't like my answer because I've already preached it. The answer is, you don't have Jesus. He fills you. Or perhaps you need to pursue him greater. Don't look somewhere else. Well, I visited the mosque the other day, and I couldn't find it down there. You know, a lot of black men are vulnerable to that Muslim thing. Other degree, other day, it was 99 degrees, brothers standing there by, down there by the light, handing out newspapers in their suits, proud to work their way up in the nation of Islam. And we can't hardly get our men to come to the Christian church. Mm -mm, we can do better. We're getting ready to take communion. But I want to know before we receive it, who will embrace these realities? Because of what Christ did on the cross, I don't have to be bound in man's religion, and I'm going to set my mind on the things of God. And while concentrating on him, I'm, I'm going to work out with Christ's help through the Holy Spirit the cravings and the sin of this earthly temple. The reality is you got to do it. You have to do it. The reality is it's God's calling. If I'm talking to you, stand right where you are. Stand right where you are. If I'm talking to you, hallelujah. Stand right where you are. I want the Lord. I want the Lord. I want the Lord. I want the Lord. I want these things. I'm going to pursue Jesus. I'm pursuing Jesus. Pursuing him with everything that I have in me. For he is my God. He's my keeper. I want Jesus. I'm pursuing the Lord with everything that I have in me. I'm going for him with everything that I have in me. I'm pursuing the Lord. I'm coming out of whatever I shouldn't be in. That relationship that you know that God's not pleased with. You gotta let that go. And you won't stumble out of it. You have to be intentional about it. Get off the line. How about stop studying these things? Pastor, I'm just, it just, it just, it just piqued my interest. You have to ask yourself, why am I so interested? See, curiosity, you can question that. Why am I following this line of thought? Challenge it. I guarantee if it's not of God, when you challenge the why, it'll go away. It's, you know what it is? It's a spirit of uh, deception trying to pull you in, to lure you into something that God don't want you in. Because that devil, that demon knows that once he gets you in, he can get you in so deep that it's almost impossible to get out. Some things is hard to get out of. And the proof that's going to be so hard to get out of is that you were so weak that you fell into it in the first place. That's the trap. That's the trap. But today, we're embracing the realities of the cross. In the name of Jesus. Father, we stand before you today. Those who have joined us online, those who are streaming there, we're praying, you're praying with us. We're praying with us. We come against ideologies, doctrines, 
things that are trying to intrude, to work their way into the Christian church, into the holiness church, that shouldn't. No organization that is rooted in man should have last rights over your remains. In the church or at the graveside, if you're a saint of God, these things ought not to be they are religious in nature. That's, that's, the, that's the workings of a God. Hallelujah. Father, we come to shed ourselves of everything that's not like you. Father, we come to shed ourselves. We come to embrace the reality of your word. Oh God, we come to let go of the games and the rules of the game. For there are games that we ought not to be playing in the first place. We're submitting ourselves to rules and regulations that are not from you. Which will ultimately cause us to perish by participating. We give that up. We give that up, Lord. We give that up. And as a result of being risen with you, we intentionally change our minds. We change our thinking. We shift in Jesus' name. Now, Father, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us for where we've fallen. And then, Lord, strengthen us where we're weak and build us where we're torn down. In the name of Jesus. Oh God, we lay our hearts before you. We come before you, Lord. We come before you. We change our minds. We change our thoughts. Take everything out. That's not like you. In Jesus' name. Worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God.